Chief Teresa Spence called a big press conference in Ottawa today to announce the end of her hunger strike. Of course, it wasn't actually a hunger strike. A hunger strike means you stop eating. It really means you're committing suicide in slow motion and you won't stop until your opponents do something very specific, usually political. A hunger strike is actually a compliment to your opponents because it shows you're willing to bet your life that in the end your opponents will do the right thing to enable you to spare your life. A hunger strike actually wouldn't work against someone truly evil like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. They would say, great, you're saving us a bullet. And hunger strikes wouldn't work anywhere where there isn't a free press. The real power of a hunger strike comes when the media becomes convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that you genuinely are killing yourself as a political sacrifice. That's when the media realizes they've found the rarest sort of person someone willing to make the ultimate sacrifice to save the world. Such a shocking discovery is deeply troubling to anyone and to journalists. It turns the hunger strike into a grave and momentous story. Real journalists don't believe hunger strikers until they actually have a close look at their bodies. I mean, Mohandas Gandhi allowed medical inspections and full-length photographs. I mean, seeing is believing. It was the media's horror-filled reports of Gandhi's hunger strikes that led them to political reform in India. And even though the IRA hunger strikers in prison in Northern Ireland 30 years ago did not succeed in their ultimate demands, and they ultimately did, in fact, die, they galvanized their movement through their supreme sacrifice. In fact, in the middle of his hunger strike, Bobby Sands, an IRA prisoner on a hunger strike, he actually won a by-election and was elected to become a member of parliament in the United Kingdom. That's how powerful his story was. Now, of course, he died less than a month after that election. Now, a hunger striker does not actually want to die. He wants to change the world. He's hoping his demands are met and then he'll go back to eat. If he just wanted to commit suicide, he could do so in a moment. No, 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 he wants to drag it out to achieve a political outcome. That outcome has to be precise, by the way, so that his opponents know exactly what they have to do to get the hunger strike called off, and so his supporters know, too, so the media knows it's not just a vague stunt. Now, that's what a real hunger strike is like. It's shocking. It's grave. It's utterly uncynical. It's idealistic, actually. It's counting on the morality of your opponents, counting on the press to be so moved by an act of authenticity and sacrifice in a world full of spin. How different that is from Teresa Spence's six-week reality TV show in Ottawa that the media party was only too happy to play along with. It was not a hunger strike. Sure, she may have lost a few pounds on her fish soup and moose soup diet, but she was hardly wasting away. She was not making a sacrifice. She decamped to a luxury hotel in Ottawa to be with her family. She did not prove her authenticity to reporters. She did not demonstrate her seriousness. When reporters actually started to ask questions, she shut them out and barred them. She was not serious about the ultimate sacrifice of suicide. She wasn't uh, about any sacrifice at all, of course, not even the loss of a, an ounce of comfort. I mean, she tooled around Ottawa in a luxury limousine, a giant Hummer H2. You can see at the bottom of the screen there with flat panel TVs and the headrest, like some sort of rap star. But most of all, her list of demands were unserious and unmeetable. Gandhi had very clear, very specific demands that could be measured as a yes or no, did you do it or not? They were real demands, like ending political segregation, like getting the British Empire out of India. Bobby Sands of the IRA had smaller but specific demands. In prison, he wanted to be deemed a political prisoner, not a criminal terrorist, so his demands were actually simple, like not having to wear a prison uniform or the right to get a parcel of mail each week. They were small but symbolic. Worth dying over? Well, he thought so, because to him it was about whether or not he was a freedom fighter or a terrorist. But they were very real demands. Now, Teresa Spence, by comparison, what a clown. I mean, she demanded a meeting with the prime minister. Just a meeting. I mean, who would commit suicide for that? Well, she wouldn't, of course. But, and when the prime minister agreed to that meeting, well, she refused him. And then she demanded a meeting with the governor general. Well, he agreed. And she attended the meeting and accomplished nothing, raised no points that we know about. And after the meeting, she kept up her fake hunger strike. I mean, she is a clown. There are lots of clowns in politics, but this particular clown wears an Indian headdress and has the political title of chief. So the media party listened to her every word and take her seriously. Case in point, the CBC, as recently as this morning, still insisted on calling her a hunger striker. Look. 
Chief Teresa Spence is ending her six-week hunger strike. A hunger strike is ending today. She is set to end her six-week hunger strike. Teresa Spence is bringing an end to her hunger strike. The end of a high-profile hunger strike. Teresa Spence will end her hunger strike tomorrow morning. She is bringing her hunger strike to an end today. Teresa Spence's hunger strike is over. Now, either they're stupid or they think you're stupid. Or maybe a bit of both. It is the CBC. Now, Spence was going to have that press conference today. I was planning to go to it in Ottawa. But to attend, the Sun Media Group had to put down my name on the list with the parliamentary press gallery, you know, to get credential to check in. No problem. Our Ottawa Bureau put my name on the list. I was going to ask Chief Snacks a lot a question, not about her fake hunger strike. I mean, I don't care about that. We already know the truth about that. Not about how evil Stephen Harper is or some boring rant like that. I was going to ask her a real question, like say, hey, Chief Spence, the Deloitte audit of your Indian band shows millions of dollars spent on real estate deals, but with uh, no information, not even addresses. Now, the band already owns all the property on the Indian Reserve. So where were those real estate purchases? Were they off reserve? What did the band buy? And that should have been an easy question to answer. I mean, no one buys million-dollar properties and forgets about them or doesn't have paperwork. And it's actually extremely relevant, isn't it? Was the Attawapiskat band buying houses in Timmins or even in Florida instead of fixing their own leaky houses in the community? So like I say, a real question that no media reporter, media party reporter would dare ask because, as you can see, it's so clearly a racist question. Anyways, shortly after the parliamentary press gallery was advised of my intention to attend the press conference, guess what? Chief Spence announced that she was <coughs> stiffles, too sick to attend her own press conference. Oh, there's a shocker. But she did issue a new list of demands, 13 of them that she expects the world to comply with now. It's a, it's a never-changing list, isn't it? Uh, she wants an immediate meeting between the Crown, the federal and provincial governments, and all Indian chiefs. So by my counting, that's 647 people in a room, plus the Crown. I'm not sure who she means. Maybe she thinks there will be a Crown in the room. Maybe she means Queen Elizabeth, maybe the Governor General, even though they've already met, as I mentioned. She wants to discuss the Indian treaties at this meeting. Now, I, I think there's a germ of a good idea there. I think we should talk about the Indian treaties, but I think Chief Spence should start by reading the treaty herself. Now, her treaty for her band is called Treaty 9. You can see it here. I highly recommend you read it. It's really quick to find using Google. Now, let me help you with it. The word surrender appears 22 times in the treaty. Yeah. Let me give you an example of how it's used. Let me quote from Treaty 9. The said Indians do hereby seed release, surrender, and yield up to the government of the Dominion of Canada for His Majesty the King and his successors forever all their rights, titles, and privileges whatsoever to the lands. It's pretty plain English, but let me be clear. The Indians gave up any of their rights for all time. The treaty uses the word forever. The treaty gives the Indians a reserve, not to exceed one square mile for, per family of five people. The Indians have no rights outside the reserves except this, quote, to pursue their usual vocations of hunting, trapping, and fishing, unquote. So the treaty specifically says that hunting and trapping can't get in the way of other activities, though. Hunting can happen on land, and I quote from the treaty again, saving and accepting such tracts as may be required or taken up from time to time for settlement, mining, lumbering, trading, or other purposes, unquote. So basically, the queen has all the rights. Now, I won't go on. It's not a long treaty, but it could not be clearer. Indian bands who signed the treaties, like Attawapiskat, agreed to become loyal subjects of the king and his successors. That would mean the queen today. These Indian bands give up any sovereignty. Now, in return, they get towns, called reserves, and some money in Treaty 9. That's $8 plus $4 a year in perpetuity plus a school. Now, you can adjust those dollar amounts for inflation. Sorry, that's about it. You can read the treaty for yourself. Spence has a few more demands besides chewing over the treaties, which she clearly hasn't read. She wants plans to deal with the Indian housing crisis. Funny, but that's her job, isn't it? Instead, she bought secret real estate that we don't know where it is. She wants a new land claims policy, but she has no land claim. The treaty met her claim. Uh, Teresa Spence wants resource sharing. Well, you saw the treaty. They get hunting and trapping and fishing and 
That's it. Now, lucky for her, the nearby diamond mine at Attawapiskat has hired 100 men from her reserve to work in the mine, and they've actually poured 325 million bucks into the reserve over the past five years. But that's by choice. That is not her sovereign right as a First Nation. Now, I won't even go through all of the rest of her demands. They're so vague and unserious and uninformed and greedy. Money, money, money isn't always the way with her. This is from the woman who, upon becoming chief, immediately got a 31% pay raise. And then her boyfriend was hired as the band's financial manager for 850 bucks a day. Teresa Spence is a joke. Her fake hunger strike was a joke. She has run her town into the ground, which would be a joke were it not for the people suffering up there because of her mismanagement. The media party's coverage of her has been a joke, right up to today's credulous coverage of the hunger strike. And the fact that so many Indians have invested their hopes in Spence as some sort of heroine, some sort of leader, well, I hate to say it, the joke's on them. Canadian Indians need a leader. They don't actually need a Gandhi. They need someone honest, though, and competent, who lives in reality, not some fantasy land about what First Nations mean. Theresa Spence is not that person. And shame on the media party for trying to make her that.